Welcome to the Super Sentai Brothers. This is episode 40 of The Spy Who Loved Mega Ranger, the internet's best and only podcast dedicated to Denji Sentai Mega Ranger. Every week we watch an episode of the show and we share our thoughts with you, the listener. My name is Matt J. With me as always is my co-host and brother Dave. Dave, how's it going, man? Going well, Matt. I am deriving some small delight from the fact that the question, are yo-yoists and diabolists best friends or mortal enemies? Uh, that is a note that I put on our opening notes, man, I think literally years ago at this point. And uh, I don't know if we've ever addressed it, but we've also never deleted it. By Diablerists, I do not mean a vampire who consumes the blood of a vampire of a higher generation or lower generation. I mean, someone who does a, the Diablo. Sure, the Diablo. Toy. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think that was, every once in a while we'll do that. We're like, we have an idea for a star that does not fit that week so we'll just like write it down and because we're normally scrambling for five stars we're like we're not just going to forget this we're going to write it down and then for some reason i don't i mean we could check the spreadsheet i don't think we ever talked about that one i don't think we did i did see an interesting documentary on yo-yoists okay Sorry, I just got, I had like a bit of a fugue moment there, uh, just thinking about like how absolutely wild it is and how like, just like how deeply people get into, into yo-yo. Dude, I, I got in, I mean, not like deeply into yo-yo, but I remember that there was like a yo, like there was this, a brief yo-yo fad, I remember when we were younger. Well, fad for us maybe, Matt. For other people, it never Lifestyle, died. Sure. Oh, yeah. For sure. For sure. Did, Anyways, did I ever make um, a star out of the fact that I one time saw a commercial that featured Yo-Yo Ma playing Old Man River on the cello along with a uh, some famous pianist who I did not recognize but looked up later and then realized that I probably should have recognized her? Uh, and I kept waiting to see what it was a commercial for because it was just like a YouTube commercial. And at the end of this three, is sounding familiar. At the end of like three and a and half minutes, and there was, and it, it turns out there was no product. There was no product. I looked right? it up later. That was just a track off of Yo-Yo Ma's new album, and the commercial was just, yeah, here's a song. Like, love you it. know who? This, See, that's you know, a quality you know commercial. Who this guy is. You're gonna look it up later. Then you're gonna find out he's got a new cello album. And if you're into that, you're into it. That is a sort of marketing that I am absolutely fascinated by. Like the sort of marketing where like the default assumption is you already know and probably want this product. Right. Like uh like Coca-Cola. Right? Mm -hmm. Like the whole the the entire universe knows what Coca-Cola is. Everybody already loves it and wants it. But they still advertise it. The ad is just is to remind you like, "Hey man, remember Coke?" <laughs> yeah. And that, that's the whole thing. But, like, it's this totally next level of advertising because they don't need to tell you anything about the product. They just need to, as you say, just remind you of its existence. And then you're like, oh, dang, I actually could totally go for a Coke right now. Yeah. Dude, speaking of, I really could go for a Coke right now. Oh, sorry, man. There's nothing I can do for you. Um, you know how, did you know how old Yo-Yo Ma is? I don't. Because here, hold on. Hey, Siri, how old is I Yo -Yo just, wait, I'm, okay, so obviously it's going to be surprising. I'm just trying to decide if it's going to be, which direction it's going to be surprising. Okay, in. Yo -Yo I'm going to say he's actually a lot younger than I think he is. Okay, give me a number. I'm going to guess that he's like, I'm going to guess that he's like, mm, if he's 60, he's like just 60. Okay, well, you, you, went, you ended up going a little young. He's 65. Okay. But I think the thing is, I like, I'm 36, and I feel like I have always... That's kind of where my guess was going. Like, I have always known... Like, I don't remember finding out, like, ah, yes, Yo-Yo Ma, the famous cellist. I was like, oh, yeah, like, there's one famous cellist in the world, and it's Yo-Yo Ma. Um, and so the fact right. that, like, when I found out about him, he was, like, you know... For, already like, like yeah he was like yeah 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 he was like a little older than we are now and already a, and you know like had probably been a world famous cellist for like a decade like kind of blows my mind 
Oh, dude, there's videos of him, like, there's videos of him performing on TV when he's, like, six or something. He, the dude has been in the game forever. Yeah, dude. Man, you know Ma. Soundtrack to uh, Crouching Tiger. Anyway, that's not what we're talking about, Dave. We're talking about something we've only seen once. Denji Sentai Mega Ranger, episode 40, Scary, Bad Women. Uh, written by Yasuko Kobayashi, so you know it's going to be a good one. Um, original air date November 30th, 1997. Of course, you can watch along with us on the DVDs or at ShoutFactoryTV.com. But before we talk about that, Dave, we have our officially award-winning opening segment. Of course, shining in the heavens, there are five stars. Would you like to know what our first star of the week is? I uh, burned with curiosity, Matt. Dave, uh, in in previous weeks, um, recently previous weeks, in recent weeks, I think that's the mm-hmm. way that you're supposed to say that. In recent weeks, Dave, I have talked about the fact that post-vaccine... I have been trying to uh, get out into the world again. Yes. After a, a, a long season away. I mean, four seasons away. But you know what I mean. A season of life away. Um, and how do you measure a year, even? Anyway, so... The... I, there's just, like, so many ways is the thing. Well, sure, yeah. Um, there's one specific way, but uh, I... I I don't remember the exact number of minutes off the top of my head. Anyway, Dave, um, the strange thing is that I am really loving the experience of being back out in the world. As you know, I'm a very social guy under mm-hmm, normal circumstances, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and I have been uh, languishing and sort of uh, withering on the vine a bit um, in absence of those. And so getting back into it is something I've really looked forward to for a long time. And I'm doing it now, and it is very good. Very the, exciting. The, the thing that I've been saying recently, though, is that, like, uh, it is very good to feel normal, but it is not yet normal to feel good. Mm. Like, that is sort of where nor I am. Is it, nor is it normal to feel normal. No, no. But it is good to feel normal. It know, is good to as... feel normal. It's not normal to feel normal. Yeah, no, that's a whole big weird mess. Um, But here's the thing that I'm running into, is that, like, you know... um. Um, you know, I'm not just saying like, yes, I will go do every social thing because, you know, the world's still weird. And Yeah, you got to uh, go like go to work and I've got to go to work and, uh, you know, and I'm not just diving back into every sort of event, obviously. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm still keeping my head on a swivel, but, um, you know, things are a lot more relaxed. And so when people say like, hey, man, uh, it's such and such's birthday or it's tuesday and we're right. just I'm actually going out to a, outside i'm going somewhere. to a birthday thing this saturday yeah i mean too um but you know like i've just been saying like well yeah of course i've been wanting to do stuff for a year of course i would say yes to that i would be like it would be it would very be strange mad for not me not to. to it would be absolutely insane yeah, yeah. um but the problem is dave there's only so many like what i'm remembering is like there are only so many days in a week and sometimes there are two things that happen on the same day or more than two things like, like, well, I think particularly like, now, everybody's like, everybody's just trying to be packed all the time. Like, everybody's trying to do stuff. Right. Like, we got to do stuff. Like, like, finally, we are, you know, we are free. <laughs> like, let's get out into the world. And I'll just, like, look at my evening and be like, oh, I, I have, like, double booked myself. <laughs> like, like, there's <laughs> literally so much, it's only so much time you can do. Like, a social... I, after having literally no obligations for, like, 14 months, other than, like, I have to be doing work between 9 and 5, like, now the idea that I actually have to work around, like, a social calendar is, like, that is something that I've completely forgotten how to do effectively. And I know that I used to be <laughs> okay at it. I was never great at it, to be fair. Um, but now I'm like, oh, geez, like, like we're, we normally record this on a Tuesday. We are recording on a Thursday. Um, be, like not just for that reason, but I have been grateful that we've been able to move it two days because I've definitely had things to do both of those days. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's just, it is just a period of transition, uh, transition to something better, which is very exciting, but you know, transitions are always a little rocky and I'm just trying to get my... Try, still trying get to get your feet a bearing, on get it. your feet under yeah. you. No, I dig it. I dig it. Dave, what is our second star of the week? So our second star of the week, Matt, is a is a project that I'm working on, which is a it's a it's kind of a new thing. So it started off as a 
as a an exalted fan project um mm-hmm. moving exalted into the powered by the apocalypse system because exalted is great and i love the fiction of it uh but the system is it's really uh it's clunky it's so clunky like it's almost unplayable and uh, I, uh, uh, friends and listeners, if you are uh, not a longtime listener, Ex- Exalted is a tabletop role playing game that David oh, yeah, loves, yeah, thank you. and powered by the apocalypse is sort of an open sourced role playing game system. Yeah, and so as I was like kind of hacking away at this at this thing, and uh, I've had a lot of fun with it because do, working on it has given me some insights about some stuff I really want to work on for. Um, Go Sentai Heroes, which is still sort of like in the works, just like my life is is totally busy. And um, because I have uh, ADHD, the mm-hmm. I am stalled out on the Go Sentai Heroes because now it's a lot of like small, finicky little details. Yeah, and it's much more fun to, to start like, a new, fresh project. Yeah, that have to be like methodically worked through. So that's kind of out right now. Um but anyway, so I, when I was working on it, I was like, man, you know what I really would, would be super cool is to play, like, Culture Hero the game. Like, that would be like that would be pretty sick. Like, play a game where you are, you know, you're not just, like, a, a D&D hero set in, like, ancient Greece or whatever. Like, because Culture Heroes are a much more uh, important thing, Right. They mm-hmm. are they are definitional for cultures, right? Like they are instructive. Like how should you be, young Greek child? You should be like Odysseus, right? And and he does all of these things. And I was I was trying to figure. I was like, man, I just I, there's no hook to the game though. Like I can't figure out how to like get my get my teeth into like culture hero, culture hero of the game because. Like, what are you going to be doing? You're just going to be, you know, if you said it in ancient Greece, you're just going to, you're going to be either Odysseus or Achilles or whatever, right? right? Like, you're just going to be. There's only so many of those to go around. Right. So, like, what do you have to do? And, um, and I thought what would be cool, and I was briefly kind of tangentially inspired by the game The Quiet Year, which is a game where you kind of, like, go through and build a community um, I don't know a whole lot about it, but just that spark of like the whole game is that you build a community was enough to kind of like move the ball for me. So the game I'm working on now is called uh, Rise Birth of Legends, which is uh, admittedly a little bit overwrought. Sure. But it's a game about culture heroes. So... And stories about culture heroes are always like melodramatic and overwrought. Yeah. So I would say it is wrought. It is appropriately, because if it were not overwrought, it would in fact be underwrought, would be my argument here. Mm-hmm. So here's kind of how I'm envisioning the game. And I'm still sort of knocking out the details. Like this is even like, this isn't like proto-alpha. I don't know if there's something that comes before alpha, but it's that. So the Zordon idea- Zordon comes before alpha, Dave. What's again? Zordon comes before alpha. Oh, that's a great poll. That's a great- Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so- the kind of idea that I had is this, is that you start off and you don't make your characters, right? You start off with cultural events that are happening and you go through like a whole series of, of like roles to determine like what cultural events happen that are shaping your culture. And this first segment of the game might take place over the course of like 300 years or 400 years, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like one of the events, for example, one of the events is like a military class. So like a military class might be established or abolished or something. Right. But like a formalized military class, like is part of your world now. Well, the, you know, obviously that sort of thing takes a long time to develop. Right. So the initial portion of the game in like the t- so you're basically you're creating your whole your own culture, okay, mm-hmm. and you decide like where it's set. Is it set on a world that's like Earth? Is it set on just like an empty world, like a post-apocalyptic world? Is it set on like a new planet on like the fringes of the galaxy? Like yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. up to you, right? And then a culture is established, but then at any point in that like few hundred years, you can inject your you can inject like your character. So you could say like, oh, okay. this is the thing. 
You know what I like, mean? Like this event that has like randomly come up through the culture creation is the inciting incident for the creation of a culture hero. And that's uh, when yes. you start like character building within yep. society building. Precisely. Yeah. So it'd be like, oh, a military class. It'd be like, oh, well, a military class exists because like Thraknor defeats like a whole army by himself and like institutes mm -hmm. a knighthood based around animals or something. You know what I mean? Like, sure. Say, for example, like a, like a rhinoceros. Yes, precisely. So, so once character creation is done, you kind of start playing the game and you're like out having culture hero adventures. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but a key element of this, because like, this is a culture hero thing is that you have a period where you're like actively adventuring and like in and around and moving in society. And then you have a period where you're not right. You're like removed from it for some reason. Right. And then you kind of come back and maybe you have more adventures and then you're removed from it again for like a longer period of time. Right. So, and then, so eventually what happens is like you have an adventure and then you go into a period of like extremely long removal. So like, if you think of like, King, okay, let me just like use King Arthur, for example, okay. King Arthur has his initial adventures and then he retreats to the court at Camelot. Right. And he's mm -hmm. there for a while. And then he goes out and he has more adventures and then he, King Arthur didn't actually go on crusade, but like, let's say he went on crusade. Right. So okay. like he goes on crusade and then he's gone for like, 10 years and then he comes back and he has a few more adventures and then he's wounded mortally and just has to like uh rest on the isle of apples for like a thousand years until england needs him again mm -hmm. so the final story arc uh in any rise game is like you have been gone for like a thousand years for some reason and now you come back in some way, maybe you're reborn, you wake back up, you come out of stasis, like whatever it is, and you rejoin the society like a thousand years later and have like your gigantic final adventure. And then like the game is over. Um, that I think is so very compelling because I feel like not enough role-playing games are built around the idea of a story having a definitive end point. Now, in some ways, that's a great thing about role-playing games because we've been playing the same mage characters for, you know, better part of 20, 20 years. years or something, right. But, like, that's not what you want for every game. You know, for, you know, for, like, Dungeons & Dragons doesn't make you stop. It just stops letting you level up when you hit a certain point. Right. You know? So, anyways. Whereas, like, in this, like, you know, if, if it's... Like, I feel like there's a, there's a compelling way to do something like this that doesn't exist in... Uh, in a D and D, which I think is fun, I think that's a cool opportunity. Yeah, so um, it's I think it'll be cool and fun, and I'll I'll let people know how it goes later. Uh, Matt, what is our third star of the week? Dave, I ate so much pizza last night. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Uh, so uh, one of the was things it, was it particularly good pizza? It was actually. Um, there uh, one of the things I was previously saying that like was distracting my social calendar, which exists again. Uh, was that yesterday was the first pizza club we had had in, you know, over a year. The first proper one. There was like a summertime, like, potluck patio pizza party um, that existed. But, you know, like, the point of pizza club is we go to a rest, like, you know, 10 of us go to a restaurant. We order as much of the menu as we can fit on the table. We split the check evenly amongst everybody there. And we just, like, hang out and try different pizza places all over town. Well, most of those places were closed. And even if they were, we weren't going inside. But now, everybody in Pizza Club is vaccinated. And we found, like, a small enough place that, like, we were basically the only people inside. Like, we, like they had one big table and we took it, basically. <laughs> or rather, they had a bunch of small tables and they had to sort of push them together to make one big table. Um, the problem is that I... <sighs> I must not eat as much as I used to because I saw all of these pizzas show up at the table and I'm like, great, I can effectively eat pieces of pizza forever. Like, you know, you have to like, you know, get up and walk around for a little bit in between some of them. But like, generally mm -hmm. speaking, like if there's 
you know, it takes a long time for me to hit the end of pizza, you know? Y- yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think when you hit the end, often you feel like you actually have inadvertently kind of rocketed past it a little bit. Well, this is what happened to me yesterday, is that <laughs> I, I did not realize that my end goal, my end point had shifted in the mm. course of the last year. Dangerous. And so Dangerous. I like, I just Well, see, you're out of training, in. right? That's exactly the thing, which probably is for the best. Um, I'm probably much healthier now than I was a year ago. Um, but boy, oh boy, we went to a place called Ohio City Pizzeria, uh, which is right on the rain road in Ohio City in Cleveland. Um, really good stuff. They had this one pizza. Now, go with me on this, because um, immediately you're going to say, this isn't good. Man, I'm preparing for a journey. Go ahead. Uh, it's pizza that they put spaghetti on. That's okay. That's a far journey, man. Okay, now, come back with me. Here's I would like to, because I feel is. like I don't like this journey. Imagine a good, just standard, regular cheese pizza. It's like crust, pizza sauce, cheese. I'm there. Right? I'm there. Now, I have experienced a spaghetti pizza in the past, where they just then get, like, you know, sauced up spaghetti, put it on top, throw it in the oven, and it comes out, and it's just like a goopy mess. Because that's not a pizza topping. That's a Mm -hmm. different meal that you just put on top of a pizza. But here what they did is very interesting. So they had the pizza sauce and then the cheese. And then on top of the cheese, they had had more sauce. But it wasn't pizza sauce. It was pasta sauce. Which is a different sauce. They're both red sauces. It is very much a different sauce. But it wasn't just like spread on top. It was in like, it was like, you know, it was like dolloped across the pizza. Like, as though it were a topping. Hmm. And then they took, they put spaghetti on top, but the spaghetti was not dressed. The spaghetti, which did not cover the pizza, it was just like, you Uh know, arranged on it like a topping, was not dressed, but it was cooked. So, like, not dressed at all? Not dressed at all. I mean, maybe there was some olive oil or something, but like, it was not dressed in sauce. So Mm -hmm. then they, they, so they got like, the other sauce and the unsauced pasta, but not a ton mm-hmm. of it. And they put it in the oven so that the pasta on top, like, bra- like got, like, crispy. Okay. And then when they pulled it out, they sort of, like, you know, they sprinkled some, like, uh, some fresh uh, parsley on top of the pizza. I do feel so like it you- would have been better if the pasta was a little bit dressed. No, because here's the, here, I think, is what was very good about it. Is that you got this, and I know you're not a huge uh, contra- uh, texture contrast guy with food. I'm, it's, um, I, or, as I get older. But this was a very interesting texture contrast because, like, you had the multiple, like, different types of, like, sauce and cheese. But then on top, you just had this sort of, like, it was like spaghetti cracklins. It was just, it was How very, much spaghetti are we talking here, man? Not a ton. Not a ton. Okay. Like I said, it was a topping. It was not a layer. It was an accent. Okay, no, no, no. Okay, I I got you. Again, I do still think it would have been better to have dressed the pasta, but okay. You you, you should try it sometime because the fact that it wasn't dressed is what made it good. Because I've had spaghetti on pizza before and it was dressed. And what happens is there's too much moisture in the spaghetti. And so during its time mm. in the pizza oven, it doesn't get a chance to dry out. And so when you pull it out, all you have is like not hot, crisp, spaghetti. hot spaghetti. spaghetti. You just I have don't mean like, like fully dressed. I just spaghetti. mean like a little bit. But anyway, okay, I, I'm I'm following you. I follow you. That sounds yeah. good. Anyway, I'm intrigued. It was that. really good. I ate like boy. It was like I had a, like normally we all go out and hang out afterwards. I went out. I had like one drink. I was like, oh no 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 no. This is not my evening. My <laughs> evening is going down and like sitting alone in a quiet room. <laughs> like that is what my post pizza evening is. Uh, hopefully, hopefully next. Actually, we ordered so much pizza. This was very nice. Actually, they ran out of large crusts because you know, like their crusts are like pre-apportioned for small, medium, and large. Yeah. Um, they ran out of large crusts, and they were like, "Hey, sorry, we ran out of large." And we're like, "Honestly, that is so great." Because we are yeah, now like, realizing that we should have just ordered a bunch of mediums anyway. Like, we made a huge mistake in the fact that we, like, 
totally depleted your resources is great. Thank you. Yeah, for that's. This. Re- <laughs> <laughs> that all sounds extremely good, Matt. Um, what is our fourth star of the week? Uh, fourth star of the week, Dave, is a brief house update. I feel like we're sort of dragging, uh, not dragging, but I feel like we're carrying on a bit in the five stars. So I won't make this terribly long. Only to say that the house is. I am in this weird limbo state of the house right now where what has happened is that I we're at a spot where I can't do any more work nothing Mm. significant at least until the contractors finish and I can get the inspections done but we have also hit a point in the the project where the contractor is like kind of feels like he's almost done and I feel like he's started to schedule other work and so now he's just like he's not just like doing the work every day and so they'll just be like uh days at a stretch where I am just like sitting there staring at the same projects that are not getting done like because like if I was very far away from it getting done well that'd be you know I would want to be further along in the project it's very different very different but now I'm like right next to the part where I can start like doing stuff doing stuff and the fact that I can't do it yet is like killing me (laughs) <laughs> Especially because like, the weather is getting nice. My friends are all vaccinated and I can pressure them into coming to me to help paint. Like all of these things are like should be going in the right direction. And it's just like, well, no, there's these two wires that need to be dealt with. And so you can't do anything for a week. Uh, that's the house update, Dave. Uh, probably shouldn't talk about it anymore because it's not fun. Uh, a little fun to talk about. Not fun to think about. Dave, what is our fifth? And final star of the week. Man, our fifth and final star of the week. It's Segment Quest. Segment Quest. Now, Matt, uh, technically it was your week to come up with the segment for Segment Quest. Yeah, but I don't, things rem- been... I don't remember us establishing a, a one week on, one week off cadence between the two of us. I remember assigning one to you. And then I have conveniently forgotten that you apparently assigned one to me. Well, that is, so, well, convenient uh, along certain vectors, Matt. But, but since we don't have another one, uh, we're just going to take another run. Matt, it's unnecessarily strident opinions. All right, Matt, here it is. Uh, breakfast sandwiches, what is the best bread? Like, do you have options or do you just want me to say? Yeah, okay, well, it's... Okay, I, mean, okay, I, can, I mean, I can just tell you, but... Let's just, I'm going to, real fast, before you get ahead of yourself, uh, I just want to put a parameters. I am, we are specifying breakfast sandwich, not breakfast burrito. So you can't say sure. tortilla. Sure. All right. So I would say breakfast sandwich, your options are uh, bagel, biscuit, mm-hmm. English muffin, or uh, or just bread. I think bread is also. There's, there's the sandwich, but I feel like that's a specific thing. That is that is a, a specific thing. Yeah, that's like so. Like you can have a ham and cheese croissant, but like, no, I mean like a like a Burger King breakfast croissant. Yeah, no, no, no. That's uh, that's yeah, no, that's crazy. Um, so these are your choices, Matt. Toast, uh, just bread, bread slash toast, mm-hmm. biscuit, muffin, bagel. Okay, um, what's your best option? Bagel. Bagel's your best option. That's madness, but go ahead. Desperately try to dig yourself out of the hole you've already leapt into. Uh, uh, there, there's nothing to dig out of, Dave. I, I rest upon the peak of truth. Like, the bagel is the, the quintessential breakfast sandwich uh, medium. Now, listen, Matt. Uh, I'm... I'm... Uh... I almost said I was willing to hear you out, which I feel like flies in the face of this segment. But I'm at least willing to listen to how wrong you are. You, go ahead. You tell me. Why? Well. Why? Um, okay. Because first of all, you're already dealing with a structural a structural integrity problem. I, I, I don't. I see what you're going to say, but I don't think it's actually as true as you think it is. Okay. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I, I think that the one of the main benefits, other than the fact that I think that bagels are delicious and I like to eat them. Everybody loves um, a bagel. Oh, yeah. no, no, I'm not debating the deliciousness of a bagel, Matt. I love a bagel. Uh, let's say variety. 
there's way more variety to a bagel option than there is to any of the other ones. For for what? For an English muffin, you got regular and whole wheat. I love an English muffin. Yeah, no, muffin. there's no... Okay, I'll, I'll give you that point. You could put stuff in a bagel if you were... Or a biscuit if you were so inclined. Yeah, but nobody ever does. You, you were talking strictly hypotheticals there. Well, you got the Cheddar Bay Biscuit. Is That's not a breakfast sandwich. It's not, but it is a biscuit with stuff in it that would be good as a breakfast sandwich if but you we're wanted not talk- to. We are not talking, Dave, about things that you could put stuff in to call it a breakfast sandwich. We are talking about breakfast sandwiches that exist in our reality. No, listen, I'm, I'm willing to admit that bagels do have more readily available options than biscuits. If you want stuff in a biscuit, you're going to have to make it yourself. Um, I think that... Now, you, you say that, that a bagel has a structural issue that's against yeah. it. It's got the hole in the middle. It's got a that's... big hole in the middle. Okay. Now, this, this is not actually a problem for the breakfast bagel because you are assuming... Because you're, you're, you're thinking about eggs, right? You're thinking about yeah, egg running Yeah, of uh huh. Yeah, because you got a, a fry. Okay, so here's the thing: you either got a fried egg with a runny yolk, or you've got scrambled eggs. And if your scrambled eggs are cooked properly, they're gonna be a little. They're gonna be a little drippy. But here's the thing, Dave. We're we're not. I'm not just talking about putting an egg on a bagel. I am talking about a breakfast sandwich, and a breakfast sandwich has components. And those components don't all also have a matching hole in the middle that corresponds with the place of the hole in the bagel. You don't well, put yeah. the egg on the bottom. You put the, you know, you put like meat and veg or whatever on the bottom. And then you put the egg on top of that. And if, like, are you worried about the yolk coming out the top middle like a volcano? Like, how violently do you eat your breakfast sandwiches? Do you... Wait, now, hold up. Now, because the way that you say that makes me think you eat your hor- sandwiches on, like, a perfectly horizontal surface. No. Like, you're I'm telling just... me that your your sandwiches are, like, parallel to the ground at all times? Well, no, Dave, but if you turn it sideways, then the, the, the problem of the hole disappears. I, I, I'm referring specifically to the... That l- that plane of existence, that sort of flat horizontal plane, because that is the only one in which the hole in the bagel causes any sort of problem that is not an already inherent to the breakfast sandwich. Ah, uh, not if you use a biscuit, because a biscuit is appropriately absorbent. That's why the biscuit is the best. The bi- no, have- see, because here's the thing: the biscuit is the best. The biscuit is top tier. Bagel is, in fact, below both biscuit and muffin. Here's why. Okay. Well, what's no, no, interesting here is that, is that we both agree that muffin's in the middle, but I think that biscuit is actually the worst. That's crazy. No. Okay. Here, okay. So here's why. A, first of all, uh, interestingly, on its own... Muffin is absolutely the bottom, below both biscuit and bagel. Mm-hmm. The sandwich, it's in the middle. Anyways, here's why the biscuit is the best. Biscuit is the best because, as I say, two reasons. A, biscuit is appropriately absorbent, so you can have a, a nicely runny egg, okay? And it's not just gonna, it's not just gonna, because here's the thing. If you put a fried egg on top of the meat, the meat is not absorbent. The fried egg has to be up against an absorbent bread surface, so that it is it is a, soaking it all in. A bagel is not, A, absorbent in that way. Two, uh, it's got a big hole in it. Three, the bagel, although delicious, is too dense. You're talking about too, you, you're, you're, you're complaining about density and you're bringing biscuit to the table? Biscuit is the heaviest of these three options. Ah, but a biscuit is, no, a biscuit is soft and crumbly. Okay. Yeah, it is soft and crumbly, Dave. It's way more crumbly than the rest of the sandwich. Now, you're talking about structural issues. I think that the actual structural issue here Maybe is that density a biscuit is the wrong, falls actually, apart density as is the you're wrong eating word. it. No, density is, I'll admit, density is the wrong word. I think really what I'm looking for is, like, sheer strength. Because it's not tensile. It's Yeah, it's sheer strength. The sheer strength of a bagel is too high for the ingredients you put inside of it. Whereas a bagel or a biscuit is like tender and low. giving. No, it's a bagel, a biscuit is tender and giving. All right. No, uh, a, a biscuit is properly suited for like biscuits and gravy. 
Because that's something like it's great because it can absorb this stuff, but it's also great because you're going to eat it with a fork and you're not going to try to hold it in your hand and try to stop it from collapsing before you finish this sandwich. What? How? Like with what intensity are you attacking this sandwich? I feel like it does not have to be that intense. I feel like if I'm eating a... If I'm, for some reason, eating a like a breakfast sandwich biscuit, let's say in a car, let's say, and this is not the best version of a breakfast sandwich, obviously, but it is perhaps the most universally available. Let's say a McDonald's breakfast sandwich. Best thing I've now, ever Matt, eaten, okay, right? I'll, Now, Matt, okay. I'm going to push back at you in this, but go ahead. I'm, I'm just saying that if you have a... If you're trying to, with one hand, while driving, eat a breakfast sandwich, and that breakfast sandwich is a biscuit then I feel like you're going to have a lot more structural issues than you will if you're going to do, like, for example, a muffin. Now, I realize that the whole I've uh, dug for myself here is that the, the, the bagel at McDonald's is straight-up garbage. <laughs> yeah, that, that is definitely a problem. Now, the only reason I'm going to push back at you about McDonald's, Matt, is because in my mind, in fact, McDonald's is the prototypical breakfast sandwich. I don't think that it is the platonic ideal of a breakfast sandwich. Well, see, it's tough to say. Uh, I think now, everybody I, else no, is... I want to be very clear about something. I feel like there is one city in this country. Uh, I won't name it, but I think you could probably figure out which one it is by context cues. There is one very large city in this country that thinks that for some reason the breakfast sandwich only exists inside the bounds of that city. And those people... Oh, well, Matt... Are... <laughs> Those it's because they don't city, know that the world exists outside of their city. I was going to say, they think that about literally everything. So I, I might have mentioned this on this show before. I remember one point watching like a Bon Appetit video and they're like, in our city, we have something called a breakfast sandwich. I was like, yes, <laughs> they also have that everywhere else in the world that they have both breakfast and sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Matt, I feel like we are starting to drag on a little bit. Uh, listen. Well, this has been unnecessarily strident opinions. Right. Agree to disagree, but only because we like disagreeing so much. <laughs> uh, we are going to take a break. We are going to watch. Uh, we are going. Eh, we've already watched it. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about episode 40 of Denji Sentai Mega Ranger. It rules. Uh, watch it on the Shout Tech, ShoutFactoryTV.com or at the DVDs. We'll be right back. <clears throat> All right, welcome back, Dave. Episode 40 of this dang show. Watched 40 of these things. Yeah, wow. Uh, and this one was one of the good ones. I mean, they're all pretty good. Uh, this is yeah, good no, this season. is a particularly, yeah, this is a great. But this is definitely like a, oh, we're in the 40s now, and this show, like, they're, kind of cranking putting, into gear in a kind of a newish way. They're putting some pieces way. on the board and taking some pieces off in a way that I was not necessarily expecting. Yeah. So we open up. We're at Moriboshi High, and uh, Miku is waiting on Chisato, and her friends, or other friends, uh, roll up, and they're like, oh my gosh, Miku. Cracking the cold bev. They don't say that. That's just me. They say, Miku, what? you got to come with us. Your favorite store. 30% off sale. Today only. We got to go. And uh, she's like, ooh, that is tempting. But I promised Chisato that I would meet her here. She needs me to model for some yearbook photos. She's like, we're great friends. I promise this. Can't do it. As they're standing there and Miku's friends are trying to get her to bail on Chisato, there's like a gym class of guys that like jog past. And one of them stops for a second and says like, hey, Miku, um, Chisato already left she can't make it some emergency thing happened she wanted me to tell you i'm leaving now before i say anything else goodbye and miku's yes. friends are like great perfect and literally just like pick her up by her arms and like drag her to the store before she really has any more chance to object um so they go to the store they do some. Sh we don't see them do shopping. We see them walk out with bags, probably because it's more expensive to do interior shots of uh, clothing stores where you have. To I was going to say it's got to be right. Minute. Um, they're going to go get some ice cream, but as they go to this little sort of like courtyard area where there are some food stands to get some ice cream, they, they look down, down the steps 
And who do they see? Pachisato and Shun. Miku is crushed because she wants to date either Shun or Chisanto or maybe both. It's not really clear. Right. And frankly, this episode doesn't make it any more clear. It absolutely does not lend any clarity to the question. <laughs> but so we, she sees the two of them together and she is like heartbroken. Yeah, she's absolutely heartbroken, and her friends are like, ooh, that does not seem good, but, like, I'm sure, like, it's fine. So, so sometime uh, later, it's not totally clear, they run into each other, and Chisantu is, Miku's super angry, and she's like, oh, I saw you, you were having ice cream with Shun, you told me it was an emergency. And Chisantu's like, oh, super duper sorry, um, it was just like, it was an emergency, Shun had this big project. And he was, yeah. it was like a CG product and he really needed help. And we worked and worked and worked. And then like when we finished that, we did pop out for ice cream. But yeah. like you like just saw the tail end of it, it. It wasn't my emergency. It was his emergency, but he needed my help with it. So we were doing it. Right. And what, and what I really it, like about this is that they have this whole conversation back and forth where she's like, well, like, why didn't he ask me about it? And this is the key part. And Chisato was like, well, I mean, he needed help with, like, this big, like, you know, computer graphics thing. And, like, he needed help with this project. And I know how to help him with it. And you... She kind of, like, catches herself as she's saying yeah, it. But basically, precisely. she's like, why would he ask you about it? Like, you're not good at this stuff. And so, yes. like, it starts off with this, like, emotional thing where Miku sees the two of them together and wants to be with one or both of them um, and is upset that she is not part of that. And then it shifts into this whole other conversation where like Miku is upset because she feels like Chisato is belittling her intelligence, but also she is upset because like Chisato knows how Miku feels about either Chisato or Shun or both. And the fact that Chisato didn't like come and tell Miku that before going off and just doing something with Shun without her, like that hurts her feelings. So like it's not an, it's not a problem where there's an initial misunderstanding and then at the end of the episode they realize it was a misunderstanding. Like they solve that immediately. But then they just get into a like different but related fight. And that fight goes for the rest of the episode. I think it's a very I, good bit of writing. Yeah, well, I think this is also very cool uh, piece of development for Miku because if we remember the episode with Super Miku, Miku is like Kenta is a brickhead and like does not care, right? But Miku, Miku is, yeah, is not as much of a dope as Kenta is, but absolutely does care. Right, Miku is probably the least scholastically gifted of the four intelligent rangers. Yes, um, and she is like pretty keenly aware of it, and it mm -hmm. and it definitely bothers her. Um, so I thought that was like a really that I think is the driving force for this is that she is like frustrated and embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And it really only now, like obviously, she, Chisato was like fairly tactless in that moment, but like that, I think is the driving force here. Uh, and as you say, I think it's really like a yeah astonishing, I mean, mature, deft piece of writing here. Yeah, I mean, listen, there's also definitely like relationship squabble stuff. We will sort of revisit that a few times throughout. Oh this yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll super duper get there. Um, so, um, but yeah, I, I do. Yeah, it's a very like listen. She's a good writer. So we cut completely away from the school. We go to like a stairwell somewhere. I don't know. It's just another place. Uh, the And there is one of the Neji Rangers there. The, the Neji Pink. Neji Ranger Pink yes. is there. And she is practicing her archery. She has like set up these mannequins. It's like a shooting gallery that she set up basically. And she's shooting like her laser bow and arrow through the hearts of these targets that are shaped like the... Uh, the Mega Rangers. She's very proud of herself and her archery. Uh, yes. And as she is sort of wallowing in, not wallowing, she's sort of uh, reveling in how well she did, Neji Yellow shows up and she's like, come on. Like, is 
Are are you so like, come unskilled on, that like you are impressed with yourself for like shooting five targets well? Like you are like like I this am sucks so much suck. better than you. This is low. Yeah. And uh, so they kind of get they sort of get into it and they say, "All right, listen, man, let's let's have a little contest here. Whoever gets a mask like the helmet mask off of a ranger first." wins and we will try to do this with our respective colors they're like fine it's a bet what i like there's this moment where neji pink is like well we haven't been given the orders by dr hinalar to like attack the uh the 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 mega rangers again you know like this has been a problem in previous times and neji yellow is like well no no we we definitely have sort of standing orders to get their secret identities so she's kind of like weaseling around in the system to be like, no, like we, we're not trying to kill them. We're just trying to demask them, and it's totally fine. We can totally go outside of like standard like operating procedures because a couple of days ago our boss told us to do something kind of related to this. <laughs> yeah. Um. So they're like, okay, you know, fine. So. Now we go and it's uh we're back at the DRC and it's uh the Rangers are cleaning well, I'm sorry, not all of them are there. It's Kuichiru and Kenta and Miku, and they're cleaning it up and they're like, dude, where's Shun? Where's Shisato? They are supposed to be helping us clean up. It's clean up day. Shisato says and then Miku's Shun is not coming today. Like she is off doing something else, and she will not be joining us. So we go from there to Digital Research Club, and it is uh, Shun, Kenta, and Shisato are all there. Kuichiro and Miku are missing. And they're like, this is really weird. Maybe not so much for Miku, but that Kuichiro is not here. Like, it's cleanup day. Of course, he should be here. What's going on? Well, they both show up because Kuichiro has dragged Miku into the room and, like, like shoves her down in a chair and then grabs Shisato and sits her down in a chair next to Miku. And he's like, hey, uh, I don't know what's going on with you. But I can tell that you guys have had a fight. And here's the thing. Like, we like we are the Mega Rangers. And I am your, like, immediate supervisor. And we do not have the luxury of you two having a fight. So we're going to have this out now. Like, what happened between you two? And how could we get this back on track? Yeah. The problem is, of course, that, like, the thing that happened... There was the... Scla- like, there was the, you know... The stuff with the the school project that upset Miku. But the Mm -hmm. other thing that happened was that, like, Miku... Like, there was, like, the the dating stuff. Like, Miku has a crush on one or two of her teammates. (laughs) And that both of them were, like... You can tell that both of them were, like... We can't actually say what this fight is about. Because, like... That's just not going to... Like, that is only going to, like, open this up further. This, this is only going to be worse, right? Like, Kenta and Shun are right here. We do not want either of them to hear about this. We don't want Shun to hear about it because we don't want him to know that, like, he is involved in this, like, potential love triangle. Um, mm-hmm. And we don't want Kenta to hear about it because Kenta is an idiot and we don't want him to know things about our life. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and you could like, there's a couple of spots where he's about to say something and everyone, people are just like, just shut up. Like, please just do not, just don't say anything. They they all love Kenta, but, you know, he's Kenta. Yeah. Right. So uh, we get a call from Dr. Kubota. There's a fight, uh, the Neza Rangers, and so they all, like, jump in. They get over there, and it's just the Kune Kune, like... Which they're like, oh, well, I guess we have to fight them because this is our job. But, like, this is fine. This is whatever. Like, these people are nothing to us anymore. This is episode 40, and these are the Kune Kune. Mm -hmm. Um, They're fighting for a minute, and then uh, sort of out of nowhere, uh, Neji Pink shows up, and she is fighting. And now, like, she is making her play while the others are distracted by the Kune Kune to attack Miku to try to, like, get her to get her mask. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Neji Yellow is also there, but she's not, like, in the fight. She's, like, across the river looking at them, just, like, generally disapproving of Neji Pink's plan. Because she's like, this is not a plan. Like, you're just punching them. Like, you have to, like, do something to win. You can't just, like, throw yourself in and hope it's going to go well. Yeah. 
And the, okay, and we are actually going to get like this is the sort of primary uh, conflict between these two is that Pink is just like just like jumping in and doing stuff, and Yellow is like more of like a, a, a planner. Um, so there is a quick moment where I think it's Shun gets blasted, like takes a really heavy hit. And Mega Yellow runs over and is just like, oh my goodness, you know, Mega Blue, are you okay? And Mega Pink sees this and is just like, oh, come on, man. Like, come on. Yeah. Like, you well, guys it's, can't it's even, even stop. It's even worse because the it was one of those things where the, the attack was actually targeting Mega Yellow. And Shun, like, jumps in the way and takes the hit. Oh, that's right. That's right. And now Miku is like, oh, well, I guess that I guess it's official. They're dating and I can't date either of them now. So she gets angry. She starts attacking uh, Nezu Pink. She wants to like attack Nezu Pink on her own. She's like, no, I don't need any of you. Yeah, I'll just fight on I... my own. And then both of them are well, like, it... that's stupid. We're a team. We're all going to fight these people. Right. Again, I think this is tied in. She's got this idea of like, you know, she's sort of feeling less than. And so she wants to like prove herself. So a kid runs in and Nezi, uh, Mega Yellow is like, oh, no, kid, you've got to get out here. And then she like runs over to help the kid. And then the kid is like creepy and weird. And oh, no, it's actually Nezi Yellow. And she kidnaps Nezi Yellow kidnaps mega yellow yeah she like zaps dip. her with an energy beam that energy beam becomes like fancy handcuffs and then the yeah. two of them get like sucked through like a twisty warpy portal as they're yeah, doing cool. this miku sees it happening and tries to like dive to reach and grab uh chisato's hands but like just barely misses as she gets sucked through the portal yes so now Chisato is gone. Uh, Miku is still stuck fighting Nezi Pink. But like at this point, now that Nezi Yellow is gone, like Nezi Pink doesn't really stand that much of a chance between the remaining four because now they're mad. You know, like, yeah. like the shift, like the, the, the power play of this fight has shifted away from Nezi Pink. So she just like dips immediately. Um, she is not interested in in getting blasted, and so the we go from there. Uh, the Rangers are just hanging out in the Digital Research Club. They're obviously very concerned. Doctor Kabota's on the phone. He's like, "Listen, yeah. we're searching for Yellow. We're doing our best. Like, but there's no we signal. We're not really sure what's going on." The, there's this whole little montage of the people on the moon and not on the moon uh, on uh, Mega Base searching for Chisato with like their satellites and there is a background track to this scene there is a musical it is. It, it's like it's like good Mega Man music you know how some Mega Man music is like fine and some of it's good this is like good mm -hmm. Mega Man music playing while they're looking for it it's I loved it I would just like I would like I would chill to that not chill but I would like if I ran I would listen to that while I ran good tune it was, yeah, it was shockingly, like, well-presented and intense for, like, such a short scene. So, um, Mik we see Miku, and she's like, I just feel... She's like, I feel terrible. She's like, I feel really bad. I know it was dumb to fight. And it she doesn't say a whole lot, but we do get a feeling that, like, she has a sense of realization that, like... That she really is kind of being... Like, like this is kind of on her. Yeah. Right, like this is an internal thing that she is dealing with. That Chisato did not actually do anything that was like all that, all that terrible. And she's like, yeah. "I gotta go find my friend." Yeah, like Shun tries to comfort her. He like shows her this picture. He's like, "Hey, Chisato had like asked me to print this photo because she knew that you were mad." And he pulls out this photograph of like the two of them together, and it says like, you know, friends forever. He's like, "You guys have been friends for." Like, years. Like, getting in a like fight or two so is not going to change that. Like, do not worry. We need to find her, but, like, you guys are going to be okay. Like, it's yeah, it's, fine. You're, you're fine. You're fine. You know who's not fine is Chisato, because she is currently handcuffed in a cave with, like, bars closing the cave off, uh, fighting Nezi Yellow, and it's not going super good for her. 
Yeah. Um, so she, well, she's trying, um, but she's got a handful of problems. And the first is that these schnazzy cops she has is a, like, it's like a jamming signal. And this is, of course, why we find out that Dr. Kubota can't find her. So Yellow is about to just kind of stroll over, or Nezzy Yellow is about to just stroll over and take her Mega Yellow's helmet off, but Nezzy Pink interferes. Yeah, Nezzy she rolls Yellow up. is just like... There's this really, like, blink-and-you-miss-it moment where... Because, like I said, they're in this cave, and, the, like, the door to the cave is this, like, you know, prison cell cage door. You see Nezzy Pink on one side of that door, like, shoot the, like, energy arrow at Nezzy Yellow. And then she just runs at that door and, like, just teleports to the other side of it. Like, she doesn't stop to open the door. Yeah! Part of me wonders if they just forgot to make it so that door could open. They're like, ah, she's got to come in this way. These guys can teleport, right? Can she just, like, teleport, like, two feet? (laughs) She's on the other side of this prop door. Can she handle that? (laughs) <laughs> um so and basically they get in a fight and the core of this is that as big is just like that was my fight i had it you interrupted me like you didn't really even do anything you just strolled in and nezzy yellow is just like yeah i planned that i let you go be a big dummy and just bash your head into the wall of the rangers and then i waited for a good moment to accomplish my goal. Like, you're not proving anything. All you're proving is that I am, in fact, better than you. Nezzy Pink goes to, like, sh- they get into a fight. Nezzy Pink goes to shoot Nezzy Yellow with lasers. They get deflected Natch. and just blow a hole in the wall. And in this moment, Shizato looks at that hole in the wall and is like, oh, uh, I'm going, I don't know what's on the other Hold's side, off. but I'm going through that hole in the wall. Turns out, this cave is on, like, a... 50 foot cliff and she just like drops 50 feet into the water below but you know she's transformed at the time so it's fine yeah so it's it's not a huge huge deal um she's on the run we, she she's like i like i know they want to use me as bait to like get miku to come out and i'm not gonna let them do that she's like it's like a cat and mouse game, but it's like a cat and mouse game with two cats, but also the two cats are fighting each other while they're both hunting the mouse. Uh, yeah, there's it's that's the best way to say it. There's not actually a whole lot to say about this scene. It's just a lot of like mega yellow running away and kind of like almost getting caught and then not getting yeah. caught. And then Desi Pink and Desi Yellow fighting each other. Now, the end of this scene is a truly enormous explosion. Because Nezzy's yellow and pink are getting into a fight, and Chisato looks over to the side, because at this point they're just like in a warehouse somewhere, and she sees, you know how in video games sometimes there's barrels, and if those barrels are red, you know that they explode? Like, Chisato just looks over and sees some red video game barrels, and is like, well, this is gonna suck, but I've got a plan. (laughs) Yeah. And her plan is to taunt them into blasting these barrels, which they do... Uh, the barrels then explode, which would not be super great. Uh, she kind of like barely survives this, but what doesn't survive most importantly is the cuffs. Yeah. So as soon as she sort of stumbles out of this explosion, Dr. Kubota picks up the signal and is like, we found Mega Yellow, everybody out, out, like go get her. Yeah. Nizzy Pink is closing in on... Uh, uh, Chusato, but right before she can grab her, uh, Miku swoops in. She's on her cyber slider. She grabs Chusato. They fly away. The team is reunited. Of course. Well, by away, you mean like the other side of the field. Well, yeah, but you know, away from the immediate threat. Away over to where the three guys are standing so that they can stand <laughs> in a, like, they can pose and say that they're not going to forgive the other people. And they don't. They refuse to forgive uh, Nezzy's both pink and yellow. Yeah, nobody, they ain't nobody getting forgiven. They fight for a minute. Um, there was a bit earlier that we forgot to mention where Nezzy pink oh, had yeah. shot Nezzy yellow. I'm sorry, the other way around. Nezzy yellow had shot Nezzy pink in the face with lasers and had like yeah. cracked her visor. So after... 
after like a pretty uh, a pretty short period of of fighting, they're like, "Oh, here's what we can do." And as a uh, mega yellow says to make a pink like blaster in the eye because that's a weak spot. They do that, and then things get buck wild yeah. because. Nezzy Pink says, all right, fine. Well, I will show you my true self that, like, has been trapped in this armor. Uh, and she is, in fact, called Nezzy Jealous. Mm-hmm. Who knows why? I, I am she... very excited because I feel like we're going to get to find out the true forms of all five of the Nezzy Dude, Rangers. I hope and that each so. one of them is going to be, like, named after, like, a negative character trait. Dude, and it is some look she's got going on. She looks like a predator made out of flowers. Yeah, I, I think that's say. a good way to say that. So they call Mega Voyager. They're like, okay, Voyager machines come, Mega Voyager form. They start to fight uh, Nessie Jealous, and boy, it goes bad. Because this is episode 40, and this is the true form of one of the Nezzy Rangers. So they can't just beat her, because that would be boring. So it's going pretty bad, and then Mega Winger arrives. Uh, Yusuke is here. He is already transformed, probably because that actor had the week off. And so he was not otherwise part of this episode. He's just doing a little <laughs> voice work. Um... And, like, cool music plays. It's, like, jazzy. Now Mecha Winger is here. And that jazzy, cool music plays until the instant that Nezzy Jealous uses her, like, vine tendrils to steal both of their weapons. And then the music immediately shifts to, like, oh, yeah, no. It's Sorry, great... never mind. The cavalry is not actually here. This sucks. Everything's bad. Uh, <laughs> I did really appreciate that use of, that use of the music. So... Basically, they're like, let's use Mega Winger. And then they're like, no, she'll just grab it. Uh, and then the plan ultimately ends up being that Mega Winger will basically be a distraction slash shield while the Voyager, Galaxy Voyager, or Mega Voyager, sorry, while Mega Voyager, like, channels all power to the Vulcan Blast. And, like, that ought to do it. And it does. Yeah. It's very cool because, like, like the whole you can see like all of the systems in Mega Voyager all shutting down as Miku is diverting power like on her control panel away from everything else over to like just this one enormous bullet. Uh, and they do that and they shoot it and it's great. Uh, Nezu Jealous dies, and then we cut up to uh, we cut up to Doctor Hinalar, and Doctor Hinalar is. Like, he's so angry. It's not just that it, he's very angry, but he's also just... It's as though he it never even occurred to him that any of the Nezu Rangers could actually die. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. Like, he's both angry and, like, professionally insulted. Yeah. It's like, no, like, the, what do you, No, these, these are the Nezu Rangers. These are my masterpiece. You can't just, like, shoot it with a gun until it stops moving. Like, I was going to use the... Did, did you not watch the other episodes? I was going to use these things, and they were going to drain the power from Javius, and then I was going to rule two worlds. Nobody, gonna be nobody so remember good. this? Was... Is this just me? Uh, <laughs> so, we go from there down to Moroboshi High School. Their friend... Chisanto and Miku are friends again. This is great. They're setting up. Chisanto's got her camera, and Miku's like, all right, I'm ready, and she, like, poses and Chisato's like what are you doing and Miku's like did you not like this was the plan we needed to take pictures and Chisato says yeah for the yearbook for everyone like I just need he you're not a model I just need help and she like starts grabbing all of this stuff to take the pictures and uh, Miku is predictably pretty put out by this the, it's, uh, a, it's the, a fun the, 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 the three guys walk up and Koichiru is like Man, I'm so glad we solved that problem. These girls are going to be best friends again. There's going to be no issues between them. And just sees them fighting again. And just almost flies into a rage. Like, oh, well, I guess I'm just going to murder these two. <laughs> Kenta, though. Kenta has a nice little moment where he's like, he grabs Koichiru. He's like, 
you did. He doesn't say this, but this is what he means. What he means is you did the thing where you were responsible earlier to fix this problem. Uh, I'm going to do the thing now where I'm just like a weird clown. And he just runs over and like pretend, like holds up like his fingers, like he's pretending to hold a camera and pretends to take a picture of them and gets them both to say cheese. And that like totally diffuses the situation. I think yeah, was, somehow yeah. that works. I don't know. It's... Because the thing is, they're not so, actually mad at each other. They were just like, you know, it, there was just like a flare up and he was able to diffuse the situation. I think it was nice. I so, think it was nice. It, no, it was. It was. I dug it. So that's the end of the episode, Dave. But actually, it's not the end of our episode. Well, here's, okay, here's my question. I don't feel like, did these guys go on their individual Monster of the Weeks? Well, list no, are he's... they their own weird little thing so if if they were just the nezzy rangers i would say no at the end we should rank them uh against you know other sort of high level monsters but as we have discovered this week they're they are individual monsters like she like when nezzy pink grew she became nezzy jealous like like, I think there's at least an argument for ranking them separately. Hmm. How about this? Okay, how, how here's, do this? here's what I'm going to say. I, let's make a separate list off to the side for them. That, Dave, that is exactly what I was about to suggest. And then once we kind of get to the Neza Ranger, end of the Neza Ranger arc, we'll decide if they go in the regular list, either individually or whatever. So as of right now, the only one really on that list is Nezzy Pink. Yes, and so she is both the top and uh, the the first and last in that list. So there's not a lot to talk about there. I like her. She's cool. Um, I'm interested to know. She didn't seem especially jealous, frankly, but we'll see. We'll see how that plays out with the uh, you know emotions of the other four, assuming that that's how it goes. Um, but okay, in that case, and frankly, we've been going on for a bit. It is probably best that this is the end of another episode of The Spy Who Loved Mega Ranger. Uh, before we finish up here, I'd like to remind you all that you can email the show at supersentibrothers at gmail.com. If you want to get any updates on future episodes or check out the things that we're talking about on Twitter, we are at supersentibros. If you like the show, please remember that Shining in the iTunes review section, there are five stars. If you'd like to give us a rating or review on that or any of the other of the podcatchers that you might be finding us on, that would be very nice of you. Super Sentai Brothers are a production of Retrograde Orbit Radio. If you'd like to listen to any of the other great Retrograde Orbit Radio shows... You can find them all at RetrogradeOrbitRadio.com. Once again, we are the Super Sentai Brothers. I'm Matt. I'm Dave. And we'll see you next week for the greatest show on Earth. Jeepers, that's a long one. Now, we, we had some... We had a couple of breaks and a number of edit points, but boy, oh boy. Big up, big up.